Okay. Just turn to the person next to you and say, it was not you. It was not you. Okay. <laughs> if, you've, if you've got a Bible, turn to uh, Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. Um, so today I'm going to share the story of Joseph. But I believe God wants to minister to people today to heal and to set free and to help people make um, a choice today to let go. And actually through the whole time, through the worship, through what was coming through the worship, and people were singing out, and I really feel that's actually, um, I believe that more so than ever now. Um, I believe God wants to set somebody free today, that you, that you will not leave with the baggage you came in with today. And that we will see through the word of God, through, through just sharing what God has already said, what he's already done, and through the examples set by various people in our history, um, that you too can know that you can leave uh, the baggage behind that you maybe came in with today. And um, so we're going to go through the story, Joseph. We're not going to go through the whole the whole thing, um, scripture, you know, verse to verse. We're gonna, I'm going to work through it, so you're going to have to keep up. But we're going we're gonna, to, um, <laughs> you ready? Got your finger ready? Just flip the pages. Um, so here we go, chapter 37, verse 1. Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock, and his brothers and the lad... And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zil Zilpah. I think that's probably not right. His father's wives and Joseph brought a bad report to them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all the other brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to, to him. Now, Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. Have you ever been hated in your life just because of your relationship with God? And, 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 and like, just because you're blessed by God. And I don't, mean, I don't mean that you're driving down in your Mercedes series, whatever it is now, you know, you know with the, the best-looking wife in the passenger seat, and um, you've got loads of money, and you're driving to your mansion. Everyone's looking at you. Oh, look how God's blessed them. I'm envious of what they got. I don't mean that. Wrong church. If you want that church, I don't know where there is one, but go somewhere else. Okay. Um, but I'm not talking about prosperity. I'm not talking about that. I mean, like, when God's hand is on your life, it seems that people start hating you for no reason whatsoever. Have you ever had that? See, Joseph is blessed by his father like you're blessed by the father. And, and, and that how your life is blessed because God's in your life. God's got his hand on your life. But for some strange reason, people just start hating you for it. Um, this is, yeah, like I said, it's not materialistic. It's, it's not talking about whether you've just got money in your pocket and they're like, oh, look at their life. I want their life. I don't mean that. I mean like you're literally just walking down the street following Jesus and you just feel the hate. You just feel that there's people against you. Well, that's standard, I'm afraid. If you walk with Jesus more so than ever in the times that we're in right now, you will not be the most popular person in the street. You will not be the most popular person even in the church sometimes. You know, we're not the most popular church right now in Bristol. Do you know that? You won't believe it with all the people in here today praising God and the, and the experience we just had together, worshiping and lifting his name. But people are not happy with the gathering Churches aren't happy with the gathering, but more so the world hates it. Satan can't stand it. He hates you. Do you know that there's an adversary out there that absolutely despises you? He wants to stop you being here today. He wants to stop you being amongst brothers and sisters. He wants to stop you walking with Jesus day to day. He is out to get you all the time. And, and he will uh, use people, unfortunately, to come at you in that way. And, and that's a life, that's a, re a reality of our life. And I think that's really important we understand that, that when we become uh, a Christian, when we start following Jesus, you don't get everything just handed to you on a platter. If, if anything, it's the opposite. It's the opposite. It's, 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 a, it's a life which is one where it can be lonely at times. Anyone ever been lonely but, but been in Christ? Yeah? Anyone ever, ever really felt like they've been abandoned at times? Yeah, and, it's, and sometimes God's even silent at times. It's, that's the reality of a walk with God. And it's the reality because it's in the word of God. If you look at all the characters that, that God dealt with, there were times where they, they had incredible relationships with God, but they also had tough times through those relationships with God. So I want to encourage you that if you feel the hate, then you know that you're in a good place. Because if you know you're walking with God, and you know you're trying to honor him with your life, and people are throwing stuff at you, you can kind of just smile back sometimes and go like, okay, Satan, nice try. 
And that's what happens, and it happens a lot with me. Um, I might go through that a bit later, but it does happen sometimes. We get things that come our way, and we start to feel like, wow, you know, Satan really hates what's going on right now. I'm not going to mention a name, but a couple of weeks ago, I had a message from someone just telling me to repent. Now, I probably need to repent for a few things, but, you know, <laughs> but, but the reality is that what they were asking me to repent for was actually to repent for what God is doing here. And I was there going, well, I don't even need to listen to that. for. I don't even have to dwell on that for long because within uh, just looking back about 24 hours, I was like, I had a conversation with a lady that had an incredible miracle happen to her yesterday. Oh, yeah, we actually baptized someone. Like, if this isn't what God wants, then I don't know what God wants. If, if, the, if gathering together like we just did and worshiping God together and coming together is not what God wants, then, then, then I don't know. But it's because it doesn't fit someone else's agenda the people will always be thrown out to you. It, it, Satan can't stand that you came out this morning. Do you know that? Do you know you've won a victory this morning? Do you know that you actually, by getting out of bed and getting here, you won. You've won, you know? You got here. And Satan has done everything he can to stop people getting here. And, and, and you're here. It's a miracle. You didn't, you get, oh, is God with me? Yeah, he's with you because you got here. You made it. Like he's with you. It's a miracle. But Satan is always out there to, to drag you down, to, to use people, circumstance, situations to stop you. Not just come into church, but just live in your walk with God. He's doing it all the time and just being aware of that. We need to be more aware that there is an adversary out there seeking whom he may devour. He's out, he's out there. He's, no, he's not power, more powerful than God. So if we just keep our eyes on God, he's just, like a, he's just a nuisance. But he becomes powerful when we give him power. Verse 6, so he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There, we, there were binding sheaves in the field. Then beloved, behold, the, my sheaf arose, also stood up, upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams. They hated him because of his dream. Like... It's not even real. It's just like, you're hating me now because of my dream? Like, this is the reality of what can happen when you start stepping out for God. Then he dreamed still another dream, and they told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father, his brothers. His father rebuked him and said to him, What his... What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come and bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, and his father kept the matter in mind. This is a whole another sermon that I've done before, but this whole story starts with a dream. I just want to encourage you today that has God given you dreams? Has God given you things in your heart that you think, yeah, I need to go and start putting that into motion? And maybe that was 20 years ago. Maybe it was a long time ago. Maybe that dream has become distant and buried. But our stories start with a dream. But the, the, the thing that starts putting the wheels in motion is to confess the dream. You see, what Joseph could have done, and I think what we do, is you could have been like, oh, God, you've given me this dream, which is basically telling me that my family are all going to bow their knee to them. I don't think that's the best thing for me to do right now. It's not going to make me very popular. It's not going to put put me in a good light. They already don't like me. They're just going to hate me even more. But he doesn't. He doesn't. He still confesses the dream. He still shares it. Despite what opposition he may receive, he still goes with confessing the dream. I want to say to you, if God's put things on your heart and you're scared to share that, um, that what it is that God is maybe calling you into or asking you to take a step into or to give up or whatever it is, if you confess it, if you find someone just to confess it to and just say, God's telling me to do this, it will start to go, the wheels of that dream will start to go into motion. It will start the process because that's what happened. You see, we know the end game of this story, but it starts with the dream. But the dream being confessed is actually what starts putting Joseph's journey in motion. And I, wanna, I believe that there's people here today where the enemy has got hold of those dreams in your life. 
and he's buried, he's got you to bury them. He's got you to believe that they can't happen anymore, that you can't have that life anymore, that you can't, you can't actually ever be that person. Who are you to be that person? He has got the, he's got his grips into you, and he's basically said to you, like, you're never going to be anything. You're never going to achieve. You think God told you that? You think God wants to use you? And you've basically started to dig a hole and just bury it, and it's been buried. And maybe for some of you, it's been buried for a long, long time. But if God said it, then God will do it. If you start getting your shovel out and dig the hole and pull it back out and say, no, I want to do it. I don't care whether you were 17 when he said it and now you're 70. God can still do it. God can still do it. God can still use you. God can still put his purposes into your heart. But what's happened is the enemy has been able to bury the dreams of the church for so long that the church has become stagnant. And it hasn't been able to do anything. It hasn't, hasn't been the army that it should be. And now it's starting to wake, and wake up again. The army of God is starting to wake up again. And I just want to encourage you today that if you want to see God use you, if you want to just see that thing that's been on your heart happen, it ain't going to happen just because you say, God, let it happen. And he will just bestow everything upon you in that moment. And then you will just walk on and say, and be that person. It will be the beginning of the journey. And it's not an easy journey, as we'll read. But it, you need to start getting those wheels in motion now. Confess the dream. Verse 18. Now when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. Come therefore, let us know. Now kill him and cast him into some pit. And we shall say some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what he will become of his dream. We will see what become of his dreams. But Reuben heard it. And he delivered him out of the hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood. But cast him into this pit, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that we might deliver him out of their hands and bring them back to his father. So it came to pass that then Joseph had come to his brothers, that they stripped him of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. Then they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. Now Joseph had been down in Egypt. Oh, no. Stop. I went on again. Verse just chapter 39. This is something as I was reading this yesterday, I thought, wow. Do you know sometimes you sit in a pit? You know, has anyone ever been in a pit? That's all of us, isn't it? I'm sure. Have you ever sat in a pit? Have you ever complained in that pit? You're all liars if you haven't. Okay. We're like, why God? Why am I in this pit? What, what's happening? Like, oh, this wasn't the plan. I set the dream and now I'm in a pit. What's going on? But actually what God showed me through this little bit of story is, they saw him afar off and they plotted to kill him. They plotted to murder him. That, that actually the, the, the plan of Satan in this moment, the plan of the enemy at this moment, was to wipe him off of the face of the earth. Do you know, do you know why when we start following God, do you know why we see, um, you know, that it talks about the, the seeds being planted and that Jesus talks about that and how it says about them, some of them being snatched away. Do you know why Satan gets us then? Do you know why Satan comes at us? The enemy throws everything at us to, do, to, to, to pull us away from that decision that we made. Because God started putting the dreams in our, in our hearts there. And if that dream comes to fruition, you're going to change lives. You're going you're gonna to go recruit other people into the kingdom of God. Satan does not want that. The enemy is out to destroy that plan from day one. He doesn't want any dreams being confessed. He doesn't want anything being said. So he already knows the standard practice of anyone that starts to be obedient with God. Any standard practice of someone saying, I think God wants to do this. This is my dream that God has given me. He needs to stop that dream from happening. So he plots. Like it says, he's roaming around seeking whom he may devour. And so he's looking to destroy you. He's looking to end that dream that God has given you. And so the plan here wasn't just to sell him into slavery or to throw him in a pit. The plan originally was to kill him. And if, 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 if Joseph was anything like us, which I don't think he is, I think there's a, there's an, he's an amazing guy, the more you read about him. But if he's anything like us in 2020, the, the culture that we have now, we're in that pit moaning about being in the pit. But what we don't realize is that God has just saved us from death. That actually we're in a pit, but that pit has actually rescued us from being murdered, being killed, be, ending the dream. And actually, by being in the pit, by still breathing, God's still got a plan. 
And you might be breathing in a pit that you don't want to be in right now. And you might be walking on your way to Egypt as a slave that you don't want to be doing right now. And you may end up in a prison cell like he does later on, which you don't want to be. But you're still breathing, which means the dream is still possible. But if Satan had his way, if the, the most of the brothers had overridden Reuben in that moment, then what would have happened is it would have been dead. That dream would have been over. I want to encourage you today that sometimes you might be sat in a pit right now thinking, I don't, I don't like being here. But maybe think, I wonder what God has actually rescued me from. I wonder what actually, where I actually could have ended up if God wasn't in my life. I don't want to be here right now. But God, I'm assuming... Because you're a God that is a good father, that has, is in control of everything, that this is where I need to be. And actually where I could have ended up could have been far, far worse. So right now, if you're struggling, praise God. Because actually he's probably done something incredible to save you from something far worse than what you're in right now. Chapter 39. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, Captain of the guard, an Egyptian brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph and he was a successful man. And he was, the, was in the house and his master, the, um, of his master the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper his hand. So the Lord, Joseph found favor in the sight of, and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house and all that he had he put under his authority. So it was from that time that he had made him an overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was on all he had in the house of the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for bread which he ate. This is what I love about Joseph. Joseph lives a life of Action and example. Of action and example. Do you know to follow Jesus is not, is not a thing that you just do and you sit on it for the rest of your life. It's a doing thing. It's an action. You live it. You live for Jesus. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. It's a, it's a, it, we live it. We live it out. God is living in you and he, and he wants you to, to act out your faith. But if you do that, it has an impact and an effect on those around you. So your example and your actions really do matter. What actions and example do you show? Well, how does the world see you? How does your unsafe family see you? How does your neighborhood see you? How does, how does the church see you? How do the young people that have just gone out, how do they see you in your walk with Jesus? Do they see Christ? Don't get me wrong. We, we stumble. We mess up. Mistakes is fine because... If we, don't, if we talk about being perfect, then we're always going to be in condemnation. It's not about that. It's just that as we live out our walk with God in our imperfect way of, of, as human beings, that people will see, wow, you, you have a power that I don't have. You have something in you that allows you to get through the same situation I go through, yet I don't get through it. What is that? You say, well, God. It's God. God in me. God through me. He saved me. He rescued me, and I live for him. And I try to be obedient to him. So through Joseph's actions and through his example, he has an impact wherever he goes. You read through his whole story, he has an impact wherever he goes. He doesn't preach the gospel. He doesn't go to church every week. He doesn't sing louder than everyone else. He just lives out his life. And people see it because of the way he lives. They see God in him because of the way he lives. Sometimes, you know, we get prayer requests. And sometimes people say, like, oh, can you pray for me? I, I lost my job. And you'd be like, oh, that's so, that's so bad. I, like, so sorry to hear that. And like, how did it happen? He said, well, actually, yeah, um, it's just ludicrous, really, really ludicrous. What happened was it was the 15th time I was late for my shift. And they had the cheek to, to, to fire me. Do you not know that I'm a child of God? I am a child of God. You know, I am a child of God. I, 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 I should be blessed. I walk in there. How dare they? That is so Satan. They are so satanic. And you're like, no. And they, how do you, like, you go, okay, interesting, okay. I don't know if I'm going to put that on the prayer wall. But, but what actually comes out of it is you realize, like, sometimes we believe that we deserve to have a favor over our lives simply because we said, Jesus, come into my life. But actually, you need to work at it. 
You need to work it. Not that it's not that it achieves your salvation, but you just need to live out your faith. And as you live out your faith, people will see Jesus in you. And if you don't live out your faith, people won't see Jesus in you. And you you give either way. It says people will know you by your fruit, good or bad. And just a challenge to you: What fruit do people see? But are we like this person that prays? As if we have an a, a, a obligation, God has an obligation to bless us and that we have a right to do nothing but have everything. Or do we really understand that through your actions, through doing a good job, people will actually acknowledge what you're doing as well? You know, like it's not just like I'm a child of God, I just got promoted by just breathing. Like, no, actually they probably put you there because you're good at your job. You know, it's like me going to um, NASA, isn't it? And going like I'm a child of God, I think I could be on the moon in a couple of years time. I'll just get in there. They won't even notice. I'll just be, they'll be like, who are you? I'll be like, I am a child of God. And they'll be like, how are you in charge of this? Why are you operating the rocket? How are you flying it? You'll be like, I just got here by God all the way through. You think that's like reality? You think God is even going to work like that? It's not, it doesn't work like that. We have a duty to, 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 to work hard, to, to live our lives, and to honor God with what he's given us. To, to have, do right instead of wrong. To not compromise on the journey that we go on. Sometimes you might even have the opposite. You might have someone come up to you and say, we want to offer you promotion in this area of work, but this is what you'll have to do. And you say, well, actually, that goes against what the Word of God tells me to do. But I'm blessed and highly favored. It must be God because he wants me promoted. But actually, God's probably given you a good test there to say, is it me or is it the money? Is it me or is it your career? Is it me or is it? So understanding that we, are not, we, are, we do not have a divine right to just get anywhere in life just because we're followers of God. We, have, we do not have that right. But through your life, your lifestyle, living for Christ, you might just get to different places. God might just put you somewhere. You think, how did I even end up here? Do you know sometimes it's because you did really well. Because you actually just honor God with your person, who you are. Sometimes you just, people actually, do you know, do you know sometimes the jobs you're in is because you're good at the job? It's the job you're meant to be in. God's put you there. He's given you skills for it. And, then, and it blesses you because you decide to work hard. You decide to do a good job. And that's what gets, and then t- that's going back to the beginning. Sometimes you get hate then. Because people are like, have you ever been hated because you just do a good job? Have you ever had that one? Like, oh, do you see they get the promotion? You'd be like, that's because they really worked hard for it. Like, like you, you could have done the same. Um, same thing. So just understand it. Just something that just fell in my, in my spirit as I was, I was reading. It's like, actually, we, we do have a responsibility to understand. There's no divine right for us just to go, God, give me, God, give me. Bless me, bless me. Like, no, like, honor God with your life, and it will change others' lives. Honor God with your life, and you might just end up being acknowledged and recognized for your faith. Sometimes you can be acknowledged and recognized for your faith, and you might end up with an atheist in the, in the management, and you won't be there much longer. Are you willing to do that, or will you keep, oh, keep quiet with my faith, don't let anyone know that I'm a Christian, so that I can just... We're there to be a light in the dark. Turn to the person next to you and say, it was not you. It was not you. Verse 6. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Then it came to pass after those things. <laughs> I actually thought of you when I, I, actually thought of you when I, when I, when I read this line, Job. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And I thought, oh, here we go. He's going to wolf whistle. I'll just fill you in for all you visitors that have been here or new people that have come. There was a point where I talked about David and I said, oh, David was ruddy and good looking. And, and I... Just to, he's, a, he's a good friend. He's a good friend. But he also showed how, ba- how bad a friend he was at the same time. So what, what was happening is he was listening to me speak. He actually dozed off. And then he thought, I want to encourage Rich. So he must have just woke up and not really listening to what was being said at that moment. And he just went, woo! As I said, that David was ruddy and good looking. And um, so that's why, yeah. So <laughs> God's got a sense of humor, hasn't he, Joab? Yeah. So... <laughs> So, yeah, (laughs) verse 7, and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife, casting longing longing eyes on Joseph, and said, and she said, lie with me. Um, (laughs) 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 Wrong church, wrong church. Um, But he refused, and he said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in the, um, what is with me in the house, and he is committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in his house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? You see how he talks about God? 
I can't, I can't live that life. I can't be, go down that route, route. I can't take that promotion. I can't compromise on that. We can't do that as a church. I can't do that as a believer. I can't fall down that trap. Thank you for the offer, but no, you know. So it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. Verse 11, but it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work um, and none of the men in the house were inside that she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. And so it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled, uh, fled outside that she called to the men of her house and spoke to them saying, see, he has brought us in a Hebrew to mock us. He came in to lie with me and I cried out with a loud voice. And it happened when he heard that I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. Do you know, Satan absolutely despises it when he has very little power over you. And what I mean by that is, in this situation, as we've already learned through Joseph's character already he just is honoring God he's just honoring God he's living his life and through honoring God he's not where he thought he would be he's a slave he was the he was the highest most esteemed child in his family and now he's a slave in someone's house but he's still honoring God and because he honors God Satan can't throw anything at him to distract him from the path which is what the dream that God's given him yeah he, that's the goal. Satan wants you to, he wants to end you so you don't get to be effective on this earth to change lives, okay? That's what he wants to do. He doesn't want, he wants you moping about, he wants you miserable. He wants you in that pit going, why me? Why am I in the pit? Why am I a slave? He wants you to be that type of person. He doesn't want you to, to be the person like Joseph where you just get on with it. Say, okay, God, if this is what I'm doing right now, I just need to be, I just need to honor you with my life. I can't, I can't judge what's happened before. I can't judge these people around me. It's my responsibility to take care of me. And, to my, and my example is the only thing I can take care of. I can't deal with anyone else's example. I can't decide whether there's injustice going on against me or this is happening here. I have to just accept that I am responsible for me and God will take care of the rest. So what happens is I put, when your motivation in life is simply to honor God by living a life to reach others and nothing else, when your motivation is just to, change, to reach others, to look outward, Satan can't stand it. He can't stand it. I told you earlier about having that message. That's literally all he can do is send lies, is send things to distract, to discourage, to get at you. I really do struggle with negativity. I can't stand it. I really do not like it at all. I can't stand... Um, I can't stand it when people, well, I'm not, I feel like, oh, I need to be a popular person. I, I, I need to make sure that everyone is okay, and if I, everyone's okay, then I'll be okay. You know, everyone will be like, oh, Rich is good, good guy. He looked after me. He, you know, he, he took care of me. But I've learned actually being in this role that I can't be that person. That actually, sometimes I've got to say things that are in the word of God that you guys actually are actually going to hate me for and not like. I've learned that one as well. People get, do you know people have left the church because of reading the word? I just read the Bible out. They were like, how could you say such a thing to me? I'm like, it's not my words. I didn't, it's not me. Please come back. Like, it's, it's God's fault. God's, God wrote it. Like, people get offended by the things you say or the things you do because if you've got, if the only thing you've got and the only thing that is driving you is souls and to live for him, Satan can't stand it because one, you're effective, but two, what can he throw at you? Because you're not, you're not torn like, oh, you know, uh, uh, um, I, I'm going to get, if I follow this route, I'll get uh, maybe materialism. I'll have these things in my life. And then Satan can say, like, oh, I can rob. How many pastors and, and leaders of churches have been taken away from this pure, amazing dream that God's given them to the point where they got to a point where then money and, and things started to happen and numbers started to grow? It's really in my conscience a lot. I chat about it every week, really, about if God is really going to do what we believe he's going to do, then what's actually going to happen with us? Like, what do we do with that? How, is it, how are we going to work it? And, and, and the reality of like, wow, like the enemy will throw everything at you. But if your only goal is souls, if your only goal is to just honor God with your life and there's nothing else, Satan has nothing else he can throw at you. So what he has to do is he has to muster up lies. He has to, he has to get people on the outside coming at you from a different angle to just discourage you, distract you and get you sort of away from the dream that God's given you. I would just want to encourage you. He's looking to corrupt, discourage, destroy, tear down, 
all believers. But one of his greatest assets is sin, temptation, power, offer of power like he did to Jesus. I can give you all things. Compromise. People looking for recognition, growth, money, status, and materialism. These are all the things that he has in his power. But if your only goal is just to change someone else's life, reach another one. Just be like, do you know what? Like we say, it's just about reaching that one other life. Then he's, he hasn't got anything. So what he had to do here with Joseph is he threw everything at Joseph. Threats of murder, throwing in a pit, putting him in slavery. That, that's enough, isn't it? That's enough to turn away from God. That's enough to give up on your dream. And he keeps honoring God. He's like, man, I'm fuming about this. I can't believe you keep honoring God about this. Right, I'm going to send part of his wife. There's no way he's turning her down. You know, she, you know she's going in there, you know, and she's going to get him. And she goes in there. And he's like, no, I'm sorry, I can't. And he's like, Satan's like, are you joking? That was my trump card. That was the one that was going to guarantee the fall of Joseph. And he's like, no, I'm going to honor God. I am not going down that route. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to do that. So what has to happen then is then Satan will stir up lies. And then he'll throw a load of stuff. And that is a real hard thing to handle, isn't it? Anyone ever been there where you literally have done nothing wrong? And yet everyone believes that you've done something wrong or or that something's been said against you in a way where Satan's drummed something up. Well, that's all Satan's got is lies. He's, he's the father of lies. If you honor God with your life, and the goal is the soul, Satan has a, a lot less power, a lot less power in your life. I love to say I'm free from all those thoughts and things, and things like that do creep in. But I can also say to you, honestly, the motivation in my life 100% is the soul of someone else. We do all of this. There's no, there is no motivation in running this church other than to see souls saved, to see your amazing faces gathering together, new, new miracles. It really is literally that. Sounds a bit too good to be true, but it's the facts. There's nothing here. There's no other, there's no other goal in it. There just isn't. And I want to encourage you the same. Like As you live your life, is it 100% just for the, for the person, your soul, the, the neighbor, the, the, the work colleague? Is it just about, I'm going to live my life as God has told me to live because it might just change one person? And that's worth it. I just want to encourage you in this that Satan has a lot of tools at his disposal, but most of the power he has is the power you give him. And if you just remove all that and say, actually, I have one motivation, and the motivation is souls, then sometimes it actually becomes laughable, some of the things Satan throws at you. Because you're like, is it really, seriously, is that what you're going to do? It's, it's mad. You, you know, I, I might do, should I do my acting thing? Oh, come on. Can I? Yeah, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Claire's, gonna, Claire's embarrassed now already. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I was just thinking about what we've been doing as a church, okay? And this is nothing to puff us up or anything like that. Nothing like that. You Hopefully you know that. Okay. But what I've realized is that um, I never realized until, I think, last week how unique what we're doing here really is. And that really saddens me. It really does. It just, it breaks my heart. Because I really just believe that when we went through the lockdown, that people were just going to come out, churches would have gone through their time with God and said, right, we need to get serious for him. This world is a mess, and we have the opportunity to go out there and reach people. I really believe that was going to happen. And I, and I just was shocked to, to, to sort of see that doors of churches didn't open, and there's a reluctance and a lot of fear. And it frustrated me. Um, and it just still does frustrate me. But like I said, I had a message on, um, a couple of weeks ago on a Monday. And, and it was like, it was funny because actually the person that I've been, I've had to go through quite a lot of a journey. And the person I've been is that usually that kind of message would have um, really kind of just took up my attention. It would have just made me feel angry, I guess. But more so, I think, a bit more like, oh, okay, like, maybe I'm not doing what God wants. It just made me feel a bit insecure or, uh, you know, made me, made me feel like, oh, actually, maybe it isn't God. You know, maybe what we're doing isn't God. You know, that's the kind of thing that can come in. Has anyone ever been there where you get those things and you just think, oh, okay. And you know you're meant to be doing, what you're doing is 100% God. You know what you're meant to be, how you're living is 100% God. But the something comes to make you question it. So that came at me. And, and then, but it made me laugh because when this message came, I, I laughed. I laughed at it. Because what happened was, it was the day after um, we just baptized our 16th person. And I'd also had a conversation with someone 
about how they'd gone through an experience and, it, and they'd been in this a tough experience for 10 years and then God had set them free in the gathering that we'd done that just the 24 hours before. And there was other stories that were going on, amazing stories. Oh, by the evening, um, hello, Cleveland crew. Um, by the evening, we were told a story about one of the chaps that was from another church, went to another church. Um, hello, if you're watching. Um, and, uh, and basically, he decided, he felt like God told him to go for a walk. He went for a walk. And he ended up um, having a conversation with some guys that are here today um, about the church. And he said, oh, there is a church that's open, actually, if you want to go. And there they are. Okay. And I was like, and this, we were all there going as a membership, going, wow, this is exciting. It's so amazing. So all this has been in my heart, like in my life. Like all these things, I have real stuff, not just made up pretend stuff, real incredible testimonies of what God had done. And then another girl had been sending me a, a message um, from our church saying, oh, through my testimony that she'd put out online, this girl's basically said she just wants to get into a relationship with God and start changing her life. And I was like, how is this all going on? So all this came to me, and then, like I said, I got this text saying, you need to repent. <laughs> and this is how I saw it. I would try my best not to overact it. But this is Satan. This is how I see Satan. He's, like in, a, he's in a planning meeting. He's got his minions around him, okay? He's got people in the world that he uses as well. He's got his demons as well. He's in his planning meeting, and he's just like, oh. Oh. oh, man. I thought I had. I thought I had the church. I thought I had the church under wraps. I put fear into every single one of them. Every one of them. I had them. I had them. Didn't I? Bells above. I did. Didn't I? Like, I don't know if that's, you know, like whatever. Like, I had them. I had them in my hand. I had, I had everything. I was in control. That lockdown was mine. Do you see? I shut out worship. I shut down everything. Apart from that stupid church. They went out and cut the grass. They went out and put their ramps up. They kept on saying that they were going to open the doors all the time. And I was like, no, you won't. We're going to shut you down. I've got plans. I've got purposes to get you out of this. It's going to end. I'm going to bring fear. I've got people that are going to bring fear. Do you know what was amazing? Is I had nobody in our church. Not one person came to me and said, oh, we shouldn't open. Not one person. Everyone was like, when are we opening? When are we opening? And there was no fear. No fear, no fear. So Satan is going around like, ah, I can't even get these people. I can't even find one person that goes to that place to bring fear into rich or into the leadership to stop them from opening. Nothing. They just keep working. And he keep, they keep putting, posting up stuff saying we're opening soon. Book in. Get in there. You know, all this stuff. Can't stand it. But, you know, well, no one's going to go anyway. No one's going to turn up. That's the next thing. No one's going to go. So what happens is... Everyone turns up. Everyone turns up. And then we end up having to, there's a different rule that comes in place. So we had to meet outside for a while. So we meet outside. And then the church just grows. The church grows. And then, and then we feel like, do you know what? I think we should do some baptisms. Is anyone interested in baptisms? People were asking to get baptized. So we baptize people. And we say, right, we're going to do it. We're going to baptize people. So we set it up. We had three people ask for being baptized. We end up baptizing 16 people over two weekends. You know, Satan is trying to stop what God is doing, but we had an incredible time. We're only a little church. We're not here trying to say that we're anything big or special or grand. We're just a little church gathering. But for some reason, God keeps on doing something amazing. And it's not because of me, and it isn't because of you. It's because we just opened the gates. And Satan wanted those gates shut, and he's fuming. And he's fuming. He's like, oh, I've tried everything. I can't find one person to instill fear, not one. Not one person, and even the amazing people that have been walking through the doors over the last so many weeks have come in without no fear. Not one person has come in saying, ooh, you shouldn't be doing that. Not one person. Because we would kick them out if they did. Um, <laughs> but what was incredible is we saw this happen, and Satan's in his planning meeting. He's like, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. Oh. Usually I could send lust. Usually I could send, you know, discouragement. Usually I could send this. But nothing is working. Nothing is stopping them. Hey, and I can't say names. names, But he's like, hey, mate, uh, send them a text. Send them a text. Do you know what I mean? Send them a text. Tell them to repent. That's, that's literally all Satan got. That's all he's got. Tell them to repent. And I'm there going, are you kidding me? I've literally just had a story about a Cleveland bunch. That's just one story. Then I've been told about this lady that's had an incredible encounter with God because we gathered. 
And then we just had our 16th baptism. Like, I don't need to know whether this is God or not because it says in his word, do not forsake the gathering together. I know it. It says that we should worship him, so we worship him. I don't need to know that. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your clapping. I just want to encourage you. I just want to say to you that Satan has no power over you if you keep doing what you're doing, which is walking without fear. Just saying, we're going to do this. We're going to be the army of God. And we're going to go out there. And we're going to represent him in our lives. Wherever you go, whatever part of your life it is, whether your workplace, wherever it is, just represent him. And it will affect lives. It's changing lives. You are changing lives by gathering. You're changing lives by being here together today. It, it, is, it is affecting people. It's stirring the church not in a good way. I don't think they're like happy about it, but it's at least making them question it. Well, why aren't we gathering? It's making congregations, people within churches question, why are you not gathering? They are. And look what God's doing. Maybe we should just risk it. Risk it. Amen. We should risk it. Look what God's done by us risking it every week for 12 weeks. Look what God's done. Look at the lives that are being changed. Look at the new faces we're seeing. I love new faces. I love seeing new people coming in. I love seeing people um, that we get to know and you think, wow, these are just brothers and sisters in God. I love the new people that are coming in the chats that we've had with, with you guys. This is why we're here, just seeing lives being changed. Satan can't stand it. He can't stand it. Turn to the person say, next to you and say, it was not you. It was not you. Okay, so I'm going to have to really rush through this. this is, so Joseph ends up in prison. He has forgotten... Um, he is forgotten and he is alone, okay? He is in prison, he is forgotten, and he's alone. But he doesn't forget one thing. He doesn't forget that he's a dreamer. He doesn't forget what God has put in him. I want to encourage you this. Whatever you're going through in your life, whatever's happening in your life at different times, I want to just encourage you in and through this that you, if you remember what is in you, you may be sat in a prison right now, in a, in, you may be in chains, you may have certain things going on in your life right now, but actually remember what God has put in you because Joseph remembers what God put in him because he gets um, a visitor a couple of visitors and then he remembers I'm a dreamer I can help you guys with your situation right now and he t and he tells them and then they get set free and he says remember me remember me because he remembered what God had put in him sometimes we can be in cells prisons and difficult situations in our lives and feel alone and abandoned even from God but you need to know that God has put something in you remember that no matter what, there's something in you. And just in case you're wondering what it is, it's in Romans 8, verse 8. And it says this, those who are in the realm of the flesh can, uh, cannot please God. You, however, just turn to the person and say, you, however, turn to the person that's you, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. Are you reading all this with me? Are you? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I just meant you, however. You could stop there. <laughs> but, <laughs> If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. This is a really important statement. It's really helpful for church leaders. If someone doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. People can tell me they go to church. People can tell me that they're Christians. But I'll see it through the Spirit that's in you. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, even though we're getting a bit old and wrinkly and some things keep dropping off, yeah? Even though that might be happening, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. Verse 11, and if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because his Spirit who lives in you. Let me just break that down for you. That means that the same spirit that rose Jesus from the grave lives in you. When you're in the pit, like Joseph, remember what God has put in you. When you're going through a battle, when you're struggling right now, remember what God has put in you. Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. There's something in me. There's something in me. God has, is in me. God moved into the neighborhood. He moved into my life. He moved into my life. How, why am I sat here? I've got something more powerful than anything. I've got God in my life. I have God in me. The power of God that rose Jesus from the grave lives in me. It doesn't make sense. It's incredible. It's a remarkable miracle. But it's true nonetheless. God is waking up his church. I just want to pray a minute. Oh, God, wake up your church. Oh, Lord, just remind your children of what you put in them. Lord, they've forgotten, Lord, their first love. 
Lord, the fear is greater, Lord, than you. Lord, remind them of what you put inside of them. Lord, that they have the same power in them that raised you from the grave. And so, Father, we as a church can gather together a huge army and change this world for you in your name, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we will see lives transformed and changed. Wake up your church. Remind us of what is inside of us. Remind us of what you did long ago when we first met you. Stir it up again. Amen. Amen. Verse 42. When Jacob saw there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, why do you look at one another? And he said, indeed, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down to the place and buy for us there that we may live and not die. I love this. I'm not going to dwell on this too long, but I love this because the very person they tried to murder and wipe off the face of the earth is the very person that's going to save their life. I just got this one statement. It's definitely for somebody here today. Quick note. If you trust God, if you trust God, the injustice you were dealt with will be taken care of him, by him. God will take care of the injustice that was dealt with you if you just trust God. Just trust God. Joseph not once complains about anything that happened to him through the journey. He just honors God and he gets justice. And he gets justice done the way God will do it. Not the way we would have wanted to do it. Not the way that we think it should have happened. It comes completely, sometimes in a different way. But justice will be dealt nonetheless. But it will come the way God wants. Can you let that go? Can you let go? Do you feel like you need to do this yourself? Have you ever noticed when you try to sort out injustice yourself, it goes a lot more worse than what it was in the first place? We put our foot in it. We cause more damage. We need to let God fight our battles. So just to encourage you, God will take care of the injustice if you just trust him. Turn to the person next to you and say, it was not you. Okay. Really quick testimony. If you want to hear the long version of my testimony, it's online. Go and find it. Um, but my testimony is this, okay? Um, I was six years old. I moved to Bristol. I was born in London area. Moved to Bristol when I was six. Um, my mom and dad got divorced then when I was six. And I can't say for the next 10 years of my life, for the next, it, was not, it was not a happy childhood. It wasn't a good childhood, okay? It wasn't, I didn't have a good time. It was, it was miserable. My mom and my dad both remarried. Uh, I didn't really see my dad that much. There was a lot of things. There's a, there's a more detailed version of this. And I, I remember thinking, I want that perfect picture. You know, you want, you know, you want your par- parents together. You want that kind of picture. That's what I grew up with. You know, you have Christmases, all that kind of stuff. I didn't have that. I didn't have that in my life. And um, my stepfather, he was quite an abusive man um, physically and uh, mentally as well to all of us, me, my sister, and my mom. So we had to go for it. I had to see things I shouldn't have seen as a kid. You go through a lot of stuff. And I remember when I got to 15, if you heard the story, I'm really sorry, but I got to 15 um, and... I remember I was on my own one, one day at home, and I was watching a film. Um, somebody dies in a film, and it just reminded me, or it just hit me. I'm going to die. That's what hit me. I'm going to die. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I was like, I don't, and I was, I was in the living room on my own. I was like, I don't want to die. I don't, what? Is that it? And I was, like, I, was, I was like, is that all I'm here for? Is that it? I'm just here to live and to die. That's all my purpose in this life. Because I had already been told I was a mistake. I wasn't planned. So my parents didn't plan me on this earth. And then the science told me that we weren't even meant to be here. It's just an explosion that magically happened. And we appeared. Poof. Here we are. You know, so I'm like, it's all just an accident. There's no purpose behind us even existing. We're just meant to live and then die. And that's all I'm here for. That is it. And I just started going, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. There, And then I... Uh, there must be more than this. There must be more than this. There has to be. There has to be. Uh, there has to be purpose in my life. There has to. I have to have a reason to be living here, for to be breathing something. I can't just be living this life for nothing. And that was what was going on. I didn't know God. I had knew. He didn't even know who Jesus was, other than through little bits of things in school. I didn't. I didn't know him. But what had happened is I realized later on that I'd thrown a prayer up to God. And within a, within a year, I'd met a friend at college. I failed my GCSEs on purpose because this was God's plan. And, uh, <laughs> and I, ended up, I ended up in a course with, with a chap. And he wasn't walking with God when I met him. 
But it, at, the, at the turn of the year, January 20, 1996, we, instead of us going to the pub like we were, that's 16 year old, um, he, he was like, let's go and get a coffee. And I was like, okay, let's go get a coffee. Obviously, he knew the future. Coffee is a very big thing now. Um, but we went and get, we got a coffee, and he would just sit opposite me. And every week, he would just talk to me about his church. And he would just say, do you want to come this week? I bet, nah, it's not really for me. And for, like, months, he was just relentless. Like, would you like to come this week? I don't think so. It's not for me. And, he, and, I, and I just kept on asking and asking. And eventually, one day on a Saturday, I was just at home. I had no life. You know, I, I was just doing what I was doing. I was living the life that the world told me to live my life, you know? I was doing that. So I was walking around, and then I just said to my mum, I'm going to go to church tomorrow. She went, okay. And uh, I rang up my friend, and I got picked up, got taken to church. And I walked into this building. It was a school hall. There's about 40 people there. And first of all, I'm like, this is not a church. And then and I look at these people, and they're really friendly and smiley. And I was like, they're not Christians. And then they started singing. I'm like, this isn't Christian music. <laughs> but I loved all of it. And I sat there and I was just, and I listened to the, the pastor preach uh, a message. And then at the end of the message, and it all made sense to me, even though it didn't make sense, if that makes sense. You know, when you listen to it, you're like, it's all going in. I don't have no clue what he's really saying. It was a bit like that. It's a bit of both. But basically, at the end of it, he just says, does anyone want to accept Jesus into their life? And I knew, I just knew, like, Without a shadow of doubt, I just knew in me at that moment, I was just like, that is why I'm here. That is why I'm here. That is why I'm on this earth. Jesus created me. God created me. And he wants to move into my, that emptiness that I have in my life right now, that's the thing that needs to be filled with God. All this was happening in the millisecond, you know, in your head. But like, I'm there like, this is God. This is, this is, this is what I need. I had no clue what I was getting myself in for. I just knew at that moment, I was like, this is, this is it. This is what I was asking for. This is, this is the answer to the, well, is there more than this? Yes, there is more than this. And it hit me. It just hit me really hard. And I, and I just walked forward. I just went forward. I didn't think about anyone that was there. I just stepped forward, gave my heart to Jesus, 3rd of March, 1996. That day sits in my heart for the rest of my life, for the rest of my life. And I want to say to you, I have never, ever blamed my past for who I am today. Since the day I got Jesus, you cannot blame that stuff anymore because you have a power in you that can change anything. That can change anything. And we blame, oh, I'm a personality today. I am like I am because of what happened to me. Well, yeah, you might be like that right now, but you have a power in you that can change that. So you don't need to stay like that anymore. You don't need to stay like that anymore. And I just want to, what I feel is like there's people here that are carrying around a lot of baggage of fault that others have done to you and hurt you and damaged you, abused you. And, and, and you're carrying it into your walk with God. And God's saying that should have stayed there. It should have stayed there. I would have helped you heal, yes. He's not a God that says, like, just get over it. It's not like that. He works through you. But the reality is, is there's a power in you now that should be controlling your walk. And that's God. These things should not control you anymore. And I see too much in the church people being controlled by the past, by rejection that's happened to them. They're still rejected today, even though it happened 40, 50 years ago. It needs to be broken because the power of God that is in you broke it. And if you're carrying it, it's your choice. We're just not letting him deal with it. Or abuse or things that have happened to us. Unforgiveness of what people have done. We can just lay it down because I realize in that moment, I'm a sinner. I fall short. I don't make the mark. And, the real and people don't like to hear this gospel, but this is the truth. We all fall short. Even the worst of the worst on this planet, you are the, you're treated the same. We're all the same. We're all sinners. The people that did things to me when I was younger are still sinners like me. Okay? It's still the same. I know we don't like to, to wrap it up like that. God will take care of the justice. Remember that one? God will take care of that. But the reality is we need to understand who we were. And we were sinners. That's what it says. Whilst we were still sinners, Christ Die for us. Jesus has changed 
our name. We're not known as sinners. We are righteous now in Christ. Yeah, we're different. But we're still the same. We still came from the same place as everyone else. We still came from the same beginning. And we still had to make that commitment and that, and that decision to surrender our lives to God. We need to stop blaming what happened before. It was not you. Okay, finishing up now. I know it's been a long one. 45. Then Joseph could not restrain himself before those who stood by him. And he cried out, make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud. And the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, please come near me. So they came near him. Then they said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me here before you to preserve life. It's always about the soul. It's always about lives. For these two years the famine has been in the land and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing or harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a prosperity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you. It was not you who's, who sent me here but God. It was not them that got you to the day of your salvation, yeah? The day of your salvation, for me, it should be for you. It's the greatest day ever. Bigger than your wedding, the birth of your children, is the day you got saved. It should be. It should be. And I felt right, very, very young, when I was young in my faith, right then, if that's the journey I took to get to the place to make the greatest decision I ever made, then I'll take it again. I would go through it all again if it got me saved, if it changed my life. And I want to say to you today, if you're walking with Jesus today and you're blaming the past, stop it. It was not them. It was God. Stop putting them, giving them so much power. Stop giving power over to them. Let them go and praise God that it led to your salvation. Or maybe it led you here today. I got saved in 1996. Maybe here, you're here today encouraged in your faith because some weird little kid, I'm not little anymore, or kid, but basically is up here shouting at you, but you're encouraged in your faith because God rescued me. I went through that. I went through that, but it was not them that got me here. It's God. God got me here. God had his hand on my life, my whole life. And I will not let people dictate to me anymore. I will not let people, what people have done to me, dictate how I feel, my personality that I have. If I have a dodgy personality, it's because I choose to have it today. Because I have the same power that raised Jesus from the grave in my life. And if I choose to be a certain person that goes against what the Word of God tells me to be, it's my decision. I can't blame it on anyone else. So if you're in Christ today, if you've accepted Jesus, stop blaming the past. Stop giving so much power to these people that have abused and hurt you. And just say, it was not you. It's me. I'm here today. I am breathing and living. And I'm serving God because of God. But God. It was God. Amen. Amen. I'm just going to flash forward right to the verse 19 of chapter 50. Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for I am, in this, in, am I in the place of God. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. You thought you had a plan to tear me down, Satan. You thought you had a plan to tear me down, whoever it might be in your life. No. God turned it for good, and look where I am today. Look who I am today. And whoever you are today, praise God. You are who you are today in Christ. No matter what the enemy tried to do harm to you or evil to you, God flipped it for good, and you're here right now praising God. And anyone watching online, you're here today because God took what the enemy meant for evil and what those that meant the evil to do evil to you, and he turned it for his good. And I'm not sure... I'm not sure you sound quite rowdy, but I'm not sure whether we as a church today are really, really just thankful that we're saved. That we're just thankful that we're just saved. Not like, oh, what's my status? I'm in the pit. I'm just thankful that I'm saved. And despite being in the pit, in slavery or in prison, I'm going to conduct my life. And I'm going to live my life according to the way God wants to. I'm not going to blame it on anyone else. I'm not going to blame the way I am on someone else. I have a responsibility to take care of me. And you need to have a responsibility to take care of you. 
But it's not them. It's not them. We need to let go of the power that them have over our lives today. Hi guys, thanks for watching this video. Please go and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please um, go and like our Facebook page and please share um, this video with your friends and your family. Um, let the world know more about who Jesus really is. Thanks guys.